Chapter 9 Sayaks and Halcyon, or the Halcyon Birds. Sayaks was the king of Thessaly, where he reigned in peace without violence or wrong. He was the son of Hesperus, the day star, and the glow of his beauty reminded one of his father. Halcyon, the daughter of Aeolus, was his wife, and she was devotedly attached to him. Now, Saex was in deep affliction for the loss of his brother, and direful prodigies following his brother's death made him feel as if the gods were hostile to him. He thought best, therefore, to make a voyage to Carlos in Ionia to consult the oracle of Apollo. But as soon as he disclosed his intention to his wife, Halcyon, a shudder ran through her frame and her face grew deadly pale. What fault of mine, dearest husband, has turned your affection from me? Where is that love of me that used to be uppermost in your thoughts? Have you learned to feel easy in the absence of Halcyon? Would you rather have me away? She also endeavored to discourage him by describing the violence of the winds which she had known well when she lived at home in her father's house. Aeolus being the god of the winds and having as much as he could do to restrain them. They rushed together, she said, with such fury that fire flashes from the conflict. But if you must go, she added, dear husband, let me go with you. Otherwise, I shall not suffer only the real evils which you must encounter, but also those which my fears suggest. These words weighed heavily on the mind of King Saix, and it was no less his own wish than hers to take her with him, but he could not bear to expose her to the dangers of the sea. He answered, therefore, consoling her as well as he could, and finished with these words, I promise, by the rays of my father, the day star, that if fate permits, I will return before the moon shall have twice rounded her orb. When he had thus spoken, he ordered the vessel to be drawn out of the ship house, and the oars and sails were to be put aboard. When Halcyon saw these preparations, she shuddered, as if with a premonition of evil. With tears and sobs she said farewell, and then fell senseless to the ground. Saix would still have lingered, but now the young men grasped the oars and pulled vigorously through the waves with long and measured strokes. Halcyon raised her streaming eyes and saw her husband standing on the deck, waving his hand to her. She answered his signal till the vessel had receded so far that she could no longer distinguish his form from the rest. When the vessel itself could no more be seen, she strained her eyes to catch the last glimpse of the sail, till that too disappeared. Then, retiring to her chamber, she threw herself on her solitary couch. Meanwhile, they glide out of the harbor, and the breeze plays among the ropes. The seamen draw in their oars and hoist their sails. One half or less of their course was passed. As night drew on, the sea began to whiten with swelling waves, and the east wind to blow a gale. The master gave the word to raise its sail, but the storm forbade obedience, for such is the roar of the winds and waves that his orders are unheard. The men, of their own accord, busy themselves to secure the oars, to strengthen the ship, to reef the sail. While they thus do what each one seems best, the storm increases. The shouting of the men, the rattling of the shrouds, the dashing of the waves, mingle with the roar of the thunder. The swelling sea seems lifted up to the heavens to scatter its foam among the clouds, then sinking away to the bottom assumes the color of the shoal, a blackness, an utter blackness. The vessel shares all of these changes. It seems like a wild beast that rushes on the spears of the hunters. Rain falls in torrents as if the skies were coming down to unite with the sea. 
When the lightning ceases for a moment, the night seems to add its own darkness to that of the storm. Then comes the flash, rending the darkness asunder, lightning all up with a glare. Skill fails, courage sinks, death seems to come on every wave. The men are stupefied with terror. The thought of parents and kindred and pledges left at home comes over their minds. Saix thinks of Halcyon, no name but hers is on his lips, while he yearns for her, he yet rejoices in her absence. Presently the mast is shattered by a stroke of lightning, the rudder broken, and the triumphant surge curling over looks down upon the wreck, then falls and crushes it to fragments. Some of the seamen, stunned by the stroke, sink and rise no more. Others cling to fragments of the wreck. Saex, with the hand that used to grasp the scepter, holds fast to a plank, calling for help. Alas, in vain. He calls upon his father and his father-in-law, but oftenest on his lips was the name of Halcyon. To her his thoughts cling. He prays that the waves may bear his body to her sight and that it may receive burial at her hands. At length the waters overwhelm him, and he sinks. The day star looks dim that night. Since it could not leave the heavens, it shrouded its face with clouds. In the meanwhile, Halcyon, ignorant of all of these horrors, counted the days until her husband's promised return. Now she gets ready the garment which he shall put on, and now what she shall wear when he arrives. To all the gods she offers frequent incense, but more than all to Juno. For her husband, who was no more, she prayed incessantly that he might be safe, that he might come home, that he might not, in his absence, see anyone that he would love better than her. But of all these prayers, the last was the only one destined to be granted. The goddess at length could not bear any longer to be pleaded with for one already dead, and to have hands raised to her altars that ought rather to be offering funeral rites. So, calling Iris, she said, Iris, my faithful messenger, go to the drowsy dwelling of Somnus, and tell him to send a vision to Halcyon in the form of Saix, to make known to her the event. Iris put on her robe of many colors, and tinging the sky with her bow, seeks the palace of the king of sleep. Near the Cimmerian country, a mountain cave is the abode of the dull god Somnus. Here Phoebus dares not come, either rising at midday or setting. Clouds and shadows are exhaled from the ground, and the light glimmers faintly. The bird of dawning, with crested head, Never there calls aloud to Aurora. Nor watchful dog, nor more sagacious goose disturbs the silence. No wild beast, nor cattle, nor branch move with the wind, nor sound of human conversation breaks the stillness. Silence reigns there, but from the bottom of the rock the river Lethe flows, and by its murmur invites to sleep. Poppies grow abundantly before the door of the cave, and other herbs from whom Juice's night collects slumbers, which she scatters over the darkened earth. There is no gate to the mansion to creak on its hinges, nor any watchman, but in the midst a couch of black ebony, adorned with black plumes and black curtains. There the god reclines, his limbs relaxed with sleep, Around him lie dreams, resembling all various forms. As many as the harvest bears stalks, or the forest leaves, or the seashore sand grains. As soon as the goddess entered and brushed away the dreams that hovered around her, her brightness lit up all the cave. The god, scarce opening his eyes, and ever and anon dropping his head upon his breast, at last shook himself free from himself, and leaning on his arm, inquired her errand, for he knew who she was.
She answered, Somnus, gentlest of the gods, tranquilizer of minds and soother of careworn hearts. Juno sends you her command that you dispatch a dream to Halcyon, representing her lost husband and all the events of the wreck. Having delivered her message, Iris hastened away, for she could no longer endure the stagnant air, and as she felt drowsiness creeping over her, she made her escape and returned by her bow the way she came. Then Somnus called one of his numerous sons, Morpheus, the most expert in counterfeiting forms and in imitating the walk, the countenance, and the mode of speaking, even the clothes and attitude most characteristic of each. But he only imitates men, leaving it to another to personate birds, beasts, and serpents. Him they call Isolos, and Phantasus is a third who turns himself into rocks, waters, woods, and other things without life. These wait upon kings and great personages in their sleeping hours, while others move among the common people. Somnus chose from all the brothers Morpheus to perform the command of Iris, then laid his head on his pillow and yielded himself to grateful repose. Morpheus flew, making no noise with his wings, and soon came to the city, where laying aside his wings he assumed the form of Saix. Under that form, but pale like a dead man, naked, he stood before the couch of the wretched wife. His beard seemed soaked with water, and water trickled from his drowned locks. Leaning over the bed, Tears streaming from his eyes, he said, Do you recognize your Saix, unhappy wife, or has death too much changed my visage? Behold me, know me, your husband's shade, instead of himself. Your prayers, Halcyon, availed me nothing. I am dead. No more deceive yourself with vain hopes of my return. The stormy wind sunk my ship in the Aegean Sea. Waves filled my mouth while it called aloud for you. No uncertain messenger tells you this. No vague rumor brings it to your ears. I come in person, a shipwrecked man, to tell you my fate. Arise, give me tears, give me lamentations. Let me not go down to Tartarus on web. To these words Morpheus added the voice, which seemed to be that of her husband. He seemed to pour forth genuine tears. His hands had the gestures of Saix. Halcyon, weeping, groaned, and stretched out her arms in her sleep, striving to embrace his body, but grasping only the air. Stay, she cried. Whither do you fly? Let us go together. Her own voice awakened her. Starting up, she gazed eagerly around to see if he was still present, but the servants, alarmed by her cries, had brought a light. When she found him not, she smote her breast and rent her garments. She cares not to unbind her hair, but tears it wildly. Her nurse asked what is the cause of her grief. Halcyon is no more, she answers. She perished with her Saix. Utter not words of comfort. He is shipwrecked and dead. I have seen him. I have recognized him. I stretched out my hands to seize and detain him. His shade vanished, but it was the true shade of my husband. Not with the accustomed features, not with the beauty that was his, but pale, naked, and with his hair wet with sea water, he appeared to wretched me. Here, in this very spot, the sad vision stood, and she looked to find the mark of his footsteps. This it was that my mind forebode when I implored him not to leave me and not to trust himself to the waves. Oh, how I wish, since thou wouldst go, Thou hadst taken me with thee, 
It would have been better. Then I should have no remnant of life to spend without thee, not a separate death to die. If I could bear to live and struggle to endure, I should be more cruel to myself than the sea has been to me. But I will not struggle. I will not be separated from thee, unhappy husband. This time at least I will keep thee company. In death, if one tomb may not include us, one epitaph shall. If I may not lay my ashes with thine, my name at least shall not be separated. Her grief forbade more words, and these were broken with tears and sobs. It was now morning. She went to the seashore and sought the spot where she last saw him on his departure. While he lingered here and cast off his tacklings, he gave me his last kiss. While she reviews every object and strives to recall every incident, looking out over the sea, she descries an indistinct object floating in the water. At first, she was in doubt what it was, but by degrees the waves bore it nearer, and it was plainly the body of a man. Though unknowing of whom, yet as it was of some shipwrecked one, she was deeply moved and gave in to her tears, saying, Alas, unhappy one, and unhappy, if such there be thy wife. Borne by the waves, it came nearer. As she more and more nearly views it, she trembles more and more. Now it approaches the shore. Now marks that she recognizes appear. It is her husband. Stretching out her trembling hands towards it, she exclaims, Dearest husband, it is thus that you return to me. There was built out from the shore a mole, constructed to break the assaults of the sea and stem its violent ingress. She leaped upon this barrier, and it was wonderful that she could do so. She flew, and striking the air with wings produced on the instant, skimmed along the surface of the water, an unhappy bird. As she flew, her throat poured forth sounds of grief, and like the voice of one lamenting, when she touched the mute and bloodless body, she enfolded its beloved limbs with her new-formed wings and tried to give kisses with her beak. Whether Saix felt it or whether it was only the action of the waves, those who looked on doubted, but the body seemed to raise its head. But indeed she did feel it, and by the pitying gods both of them were changed into birds. They mate and have their young ones, for seven placid days in winter time, Halcyon broods over her nest, which floats upon the sea. Then the way is safe for seamen. Aeolus guards the winds and keeps them from disturbing the deep. The sea is given up for the time being to his grandchildren. Following lines from Byron's Bride of Abydos might seem borrowed from the concluding part of this description if it were not stated that the author derived the suggestion from observing the motion of a floating corpse. Has shaken on his restless pillow, his head heaves with the heaving billow, that hand whose motion is not life, yet feebly seems to menace strife, flung by the tossing tide on high, then leveled with the wave. Milton, in his hymn on the Nativity, thus alludes to the fable of the Halcyon. But peaceful was the night wherein the Prince of Light, his reign of peace upon the earth began. The winds with wonder whist, smoothly the waters kissed, whispering new joys to the mild ocean, who now hath quite forgot to rave while birds of calm sit brooding on the charmed wave. Keats also, in his Endymion, says, O magic sleep, O comfortable bird, that broodest o'er the troubled sea of the mind, till it is hushed and smooth. 